Hello, this is the next video in a playlist that I'm calling General Linear Models Design of Experiments. And we're going to start the next little mini series within that playlist, and this is on split plot design. So this is part one of ten, and I'm just going to generically call it model development. <coughs> and I just found a free book by Ronald Christensen. It's Analysis of Variance, Design and Regression, Applied Statistical Methods. I actually like this. I think they do this, the description of this split plot design justice. So I'd recommend reading that. And I'm sure there's other good books too. So the split plot characteristics. And some of this will make more sense as we progress through this mini-series. And then when you come back and reread this, it'll make crystal clear sense. So there's simultaneous use of different sized experimental units. That's one of the characteristics. There's two or more factors. There's two or more randomizations. And there's two or more air terms in a split plot model. Now, the classic illustration is uh, in farming where we apply an insecticide and a fertilizer. Now, insecticide is usually done by crop dusting, and that's where they put the insecticide in a plane, and they fly the plane over land and then apply the, the insecticide. And so to apply it, you need a, a large plot of land, right, because the plane comes down. It's not a very precise thing. But to apply fertilizer, you can use a tractor. So we need large pieces of land for the insecticide, and we can use much smaller pieces of land for fertilizer. Uh, the response will be crop yield. And let's assume there's three types of insecticide and four types of fertilizer. Now, the way that a split plot design works is you create a design for this uh, factor that requires a larger piece of, you know, experimental unit, you know, or you know, land in this case, design something for this insecticide and pretend like th these the other factors are not there. Now to design this, you could use a completely randomized design or a randomized block design or a, uh, a Latin square. I mean, there's different ways. Well, not necessarily. There's different ways to do it is basically what I'm saying. And in here, we're going to look at two of those. We're going to look at a completely randomized design and a randomized block design. So step one is design something for insecticide. So now, if these are large plots of land, and they're called whole plots, because we're going to, we're going to split these up for this, this second factor. But remember, we're only dealing with this factor. So we're looking at whole plots. And so the completely randomized design, you would, you would randomly sprinkle in the three types of insecticides and conduct a completely randomized design here. Or if you think of like this plot of land as a block, and then you randomly uh, assign one of the three insecticides in here, and you do that for block two and block three, that would be a randomized block design. And the model would be y equals mu plus alpha i plus some error. And we're going to put a w, and that's the whole plot error. And that's, that's it. And this is a, a, a completely randomized design. We did a whole mini-series on that. Now, if you were to use a block design for the first factor, this would be the model. So there's some there's y i j is equal to you know some grand mean plus the factor effect plus block effect and then plus error and this is just a completely a randomized complete block design. But now in the next step we need a randomized fertilizer. Okay, within this so this this is part here so simultaneous use of different size experimental units. This is one that we just randomized insecticide to. Now we're going to take this and split it into smaller pieces. And then that smaller piece is going to be the experimental unit for fertilizer. So that's what it means, a simultaneous 
use of different sized experiments. There's two more factors, there's two randomizations, and there's two error terms. Okay, so, so what we do is we take the whole plots, whether it be from the, the completely randomized design or the randomized complete block design. They're the same. We end up with whole plots. Now we randomize fertilizer within each whole plot. So we treat it like a randomized complete block design where each whole plot is a block. So we randomize the four treatments here, randomize the four treatments, and those are called subplots. So it might be um, fertilizer one, four, two, and three, and then four, three, two, one, and then three, two, one, four. I mean, they're, they're randomly sprinkled in there. And this is the second part. And so now the model becomes this. So the split plot for the completely randomized design. And so this describes the first randomization. The second randomization is always part of a randomized complete block design. Okay, so it's YIJK. So there's the old grand mean effect. Uh, there's an insectified effect plus the air term for that first randomization. Uh, gamma K, so that's the uh, factor two in this case, fertilizer effect. There's an interaction between insecticide and fertilizer, and then there's the air associated with the second randomization. And this is the model, the split plot CRD design. Um, here, the air terms are gonna be normally distributed with some variance normally distributed with some variance. We're going to assume the errors are independent. And this would be the model for the split plot randomized complete block design. So this is the second type. Like if this were the first randomization. So this would be the model. So yj equals mu plus alpha i plus beta j, which is a block effect. That's the insectified effect. That's the air term associated with the first randomization. Gamma K, that's the uh, fertilizer effect, the interaction effect, and then uh, epsilon IJK S, that's the subplot or split plot air on the second randomization. Now each of these, again, the air term is we're going to assume normally distributed. Normally distributed with, you know, zero, mean zero sigma S squared. Uh, the, their errors are going to be independent. Now, a fair amount of time is going to be spent identifying whole plot and subplot variability. And it's going to make sure the inferences are valid, you know, or making sure valid inferences can be conducted. Okay. So that's it. That's a brief introduction. Now, what is commonly done is these air terms are often combined into one. So just call it, you know, one air term. The same way here. These are combined in here. So we could write it like this. We just call it epsilon ijk. But really, it's the addition of these two airs, the whole plot air and the subplot air. Now the variance of epsilon ijk would just be the variance of this plus the variance of that, right? Because there's no covariance. They're independent. And we're just going to generically call that sigma squared. Now the covariance between um, any two of these is this. So if the i and j are not equal, then they're, they're independent, so it's zero. But if i is equal to i prime and j is equal to j prime, then when you do this covariance, you get sigma w squared. It's the whole plot variance. The correlation between the errors, any two errors, it would be this. It's the covariance divided by the variance. Now notice that I put the i and the j the same because they have to be. Otherwise the correlation is zero. And then we're going to call it rho. Now these are for a specific ijk. But now we're going to treat them as a vector. So this uh, epsilon vector is all of these in a vector. So now let's look at the variance of this. Um, and we're going to call it V, which is really the covariance between these two vectors. Now, if we think about this, so 
if we go, and this remember this is a matrix. So if we go down the diagonal, that means that I epsilon i j k is equal to epsilon i j k, and the variance is this. So this we should get sigma squared down the diagonal. So notice we have sigma s squared, and this is a matrix of one. So down the diagonal is sigma w squared. So down the diagonal is the addition of those two, which is sigma. Yep. So now when i and j are equal, k is not, then the covariance is this. So, but this is really that we're within one of these whole plots. So we know i and j, and then we're looking at the covariance between the observations here. And that is, um, that's sigma w squared. So all the covariances are sigma w squared and so this, in, in it's, and it's block diagonal because we have to be within a whole plot as we go down the diagonal. Um, this diagonal, block diagonal matrix, this piece can be separated out. And we have this, right? Block diagonal with this matrix of ones. Then if we multiply and divide by the same quantity, which is this, then this comes down, right? That it cancel with that and leaves this. This cancel with this, leaves this. So this is the same. Um, here we were calling that sigma squared. This was the variance. And this is one minus, I mean the correlation. This is the correlation. And this is one minus correlation. The I comes down. Now here, a black diagonal, if we multiply uh, or divide this by M, which if we divide it, we have to multiply it, then that becomes the perpendicular projection matrix onto a column space, which we'll talk about here in a second. But we can generically call this sigma squared V. Oh, I shouldn't put equal, equal, equal there. Um, maybe, maybe we leave that off. And then this is sigma squared V. And what's interesting, actually, this is part of what's called a cluster model. So if you were to randomly pick elementary schools in the state of Missouri, and then once you pick schools, you randomly pick students, that's the same thing that's going on here. It's, that's called a cluster model. And, and these two models are actually cousins of each other. Now here, W was the perpendicular projection matrix onto this, uh, which if you've watched any of my previous videos, this is the form of a perpendicular projection matrix where W is part of the design matrix that models the uh, whole plot effect. So as we go, these are whole plots. So if we're in a whole plot, we get a one, a one. And then when we move to this whole plot, we have to, to do another indicator variable in the design matrix. And then we move to this whole plot, then there's, a, then there's all, then there's ones. And we keep going through each of these whole plots. And that's why, this is called uh, a, a part of the design matrix associated with the whole plots. Um, there are T times R columns, and this will make more sense in, of course, upcoming videos. But it's kind of hard to know how to introduce this because there's so many complicated topics with the split plot, split plot design. So I felt like I have to introduce it here, but it'll make more sense as we go. Well, that's all I have for this video now. Hope you stick with it. Uh, split plot designs can be quite powerful. Um, hope you enjoyed this. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks, Mike.